Listen to what he says in verse 5. He says this, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Now this is a seriously different expression going from my tears are my food and now he's learned how to rebuke himself. I tell you something, this is what Joshua chapter 1, 8 is telling me to do. That as I allow the word of God to be on my lips, what it's doing is, is it's creating an environment where I am, like David said, encouraging myself in the Lord. You know, let me just, I want to open with this. You know what I just wanted to say? Uh, you know, sometimes we can, when we are in, our, in church, especially in our church, and I'm sure a lot of the people that you follow, you'll, you'll notice that there's a very common theme that is kind of woven throughout everything that we do, and it's all talking about the blessing of the Lord. And as I was just sitting up on the drums there, I can't remember what song we were singing, what was going on, and, and I like to ask the Lord these things. It's just kind of my personality where I don't just, you know, hear it and talk about it, and it's just, you know, I, and I like to think about why we do the things that we do, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, you know, we're always talking about the blessing. We're always talking about being in better moods. We're always talking about having more money and having better relationships and having better lives, and, you know, and, and sometimes I, I can think to myself, like, you know, why is it that this is such a common theme? But, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I was thinking about as I'm sitting up there is, you know, we talk about the blessing so much, and I'm thinking to myself, why, why, why? And I heard the Lord say to me that the reason why the New Testament and the reason why we talk so much about the blessing is that that's the reason that Jesus died for us. Can I say that again during the Christmas season? The reason that Jesus, you know, you think about it like this, that when we're talking about, you know, there's this man who died for you and he died so that you could experience heaven on earth. The, the greatest way that we can honor Jesus' sacrifice is that we would be blessed. Can I say that again? The greatest way that we can honor Jesus' sacrifice in our life is to be blessed. That sometimes we can think about things and think that, you know, there's something wrong with it, that, that it's somehow selfish or that, you know, we're trying to, you know, use all these principles in order for self-gain. But the reality is, is that this is why Jesus was crucified on the cross for us, right? He died so that we could experience heaven on earth. And I expect to experience heaven on earth, not because I'm selfish, but because I understand that the greatest way for me to honor the sacrifice of Jesus is that I would live inside of this blessing. The courage that it requires to step out in this is that we understand that we can do this. I could do this. I can have this. And this evening, what I want to talk about, oh, Jess said be over at 8.15. All right, we're going to speed talk. I want to read this morning from Joshua chapter 1. Uh, we've been talking about courage for the last number of weeks because I believe that, I can't remember who said it. It was actually Julia who said it. And it was like, oh, bingo. I think, wherever Julia is, I know she's here. She's somewhere. Dr. Julia. No, not Dr. Julia. Oh. Miss Julia. Julia Fry. <laughs> uh, she said that God is preaching to us about courage because 2018, we're going to have opportunities to step out and be courageous. I tell you, it's not a, that's good. You could tweet that, right? That's good. That's, ooh, do, do, do. That's good. You want to be like one of those prophetic voices that people are listening to? Tweet that. But the reality is, is that this topic of courage is not just a topic that we're talking about. It is, it's the Lord directing us and instructing us of how do we be successful in this up and coming year, that in order for you to step out and experience the goodness of God, it's going to require courage in order to take, to step out and take those steps. And so well, I want to read this morning from Joshua chapter one. Um, and this is like an, an epic text. Okay. This is really this, this moment in history. Uh, really, I would say that it's almost legendary in the Bible. I feel like everybody who is a Christian knows Joshua chapter one, uh, because it's such a significant moment in the lives of the Israelites. It's this moment where this nothing tribe of people finally, after 40 years of wandering, finally gets into their promise. I mean, any prosperity message, any self-improvement message, you will find Joshua a chapter one in there because it's this moment where we realize, you know, really one of the first times I think that we realize that God's, he is invested in our futures. 
that God is more than anything willing to knock down any wall. He's willing to move any obstacle in our life in order to get us into our promise. And so we read Joshua chapter one, and really in this moment what's happening is that God is giving Joshua kind of like his pre-fight talk right? Like, you know, he's, you know, you know how you see those like on the Rocky movies, you know, they're like giving the guy, massaging him on the back, you know, and they're talking to him, you know, maybe they're like slapping him on the face a little, you know, really trying to psych him up and get him ready for what he's about to experience. Because what we have to realize is that Joshua has never experienced this before, right? I mean, Joshua has big shoes to fill, Right? We see Moses, his leader, the deliverer of Israel, brings Israel out of you know, years of slavery. He's got some serious shoes to fill. He's got a serious destiny to accomplish. And this is really Joshua's grand moment where, where, where God sets the scene with his life and we get to witness firsthand God intervene through the life of a man. And so I'll tell you something. God will never give you a purpose that he has, is not invested in preparing you to do. Whatever you're going through, whatever you have gone through has brought you th- to this moment to obtain the purpose that God has for your life. Every bad situation, every good situation, God has used everything in our life to prepare us to excel in our purpose. And so we see that between, uh, you know, between verses six and seven, we see uh, uh, God, you know, makes these statements multiple times. And, 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 and let's just read this. Joshua chapter one, verse eight says this. So he says, oh, actually, let's start in verse six. That's where I want to start. He says, be strong and of good courage, for, for to this people you shall divide an inheritance to the land which I have swore to their fathers and give to them. Now in verse 7 we see, you know, so you can tell something happened between verse 6 and verse 7. You know, we look at this as a very short amount of time. But God, you know, something obviously happened in Joshua's life because, you know, five seconds ago God said, be strong and courageous. And then five seconds later he says to him, Joshua, be strong and courageous, right? And so this is a little bit of a, of a window into the person who Joshua was. Because sometimes I think what we can do is, is we can make these biblical characters kind of like superhuman, and we think that, oh, they did it because he was Joshua. But you realize, literally in the same breath, okay, it's like, you know, those annoying kids, how they're like that, where you're like, take out the garbage, and then you know five seconds later you have to tell them, take out the garbage, because they've already moved past that. This is what's happening in Joshua's life. He says, God says to him, be strong and courageous, and with literally in one breath, Joshua is already experiencing fear again. He's already nervous again to where God has to start over again and say, be strong and courageous. Can I tell you something? God is not afraid of our humanity. He's not afraid of the fact that we experience these things. And so he says this in verse seven, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do all, uh, all to uh, observe to do according to all of the law, which my, which Moses, my servant commanded you to do. Do not turn to it from the right hand or to the left hand that you may prosper wherever you go. So God is giving Joshua some very specific instructions on how he's going to, ex- to, to succeed in his life. Right? It doesn't have to do with skills. It doesn't have to do with talents. That's good news for us. It doesn't mean that we have to be the best of the best or the smartest of the smartest. But God says this, what? Meditate on the word day and night and you will observe to do. Okay, and so God gives him one stipulation, meditate. And then in verse eight, it says this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then you will make you a prosperous and you will have good success. So this is God giving giving Joshua very clear, very strict instructions about how he's going to basically do the impossible how he's going to take this group of nobodies and turn them into somebodies, how he's going to take this land where they don't own an acre and they're going to possess the whole thing. God is interested in getting us into our promise. And, and okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message tonight. Lord, I'm praying that it would be, I love how your, your whole theme is encouraging tonight because that's really what I feel like God wants to do. Lord, that we would be encouraged by your word as we see the greatness of who you are. Lord, as we realize who we are and who you've made us to be, cause us to see ourselves this way. Father, we ask for your word word that it would just touch our hearts in such a deep way that it would transform us in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So as we're, we're kind of talking about this, you know, I, I was talking to a friend earlier this week. Maybe it wasn't this week. Maybe it was last week. Um, and we were kind of talking about this idea about how, you know, we shrink down Bible stories in order to fit our life, right? Like, you ever done that? And I think that that sometimes is the problem with being a preacher, is like, you need to find like, you know, how does this crazy story have to apply to my life, right? Like, you, you might be talking to your friend and be like, you know, David conquered Goliath, and you could lose 15 pounds too, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, we do that. We do funny things like this where we, we talk about, you know, these grandiose stories, uh, and we shrink them down in order to work in our own lives, right? And so the reality is, is that Goliath in our life can be, you know, like a student loan. Goliath can be, you know, that bill that you have to pay, right? He's no longer this, you know, this, you know, earth-shaking, you know, undefied giant who wants to, you know, tear the, 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 the people of Israel apart, you know, but now he's 15 pounds or, you know, he's a bill that we have to pay. Uh, and, you know, and we do this because I think that it's so important because the reality is, is that, you know, uh, I, I like to believe that the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if the principles applied then, the principles apply now. Yes. That our situations and our circumstances be different, but if truth is truth, it's going to it will help me defeat a giant, and it will also help me to lose 15 pounds. Now, in this, I feel like sometimes what the problem can be is that we can sometimes forget exactly what Joshua was going through in this moment. You know, because sometimes when we talk about, you know, we're going into the promised land, we're talking about, you know, we're going to get some girl to go on a date with us, okay? <laughs> but Joshua was experiencing something seriously different in his life at this moment. Like, we have to realize that, you know, here stands this man, and, you know, uh, you know not a soldier, he's not, you know, a trained man of war, and God is bringing him into a place where he realizes that the next significant portion of his life is going to require him to use a skill to be a person that he himself knows he is not qualified to be. This is where we find Joshua in this moment as he looks up at the walls of Jericho, you know, these thick walls that were so thick that they said you could drive a chariot. It's basically like you could drive a car around the top of the wall is how thick they were, right? Like we're not talking about it's like a little kid's fort, right? That's like a cardboard wall that you've got to punch through. We're talking about walls so thick that you could drive a transport truck around. And Joshua in this moment is the leader of millions of people. And he's looking at this wall as they look at him, not thinking that he's going to know what to do when he realizes, I have no clue how I'm going to get these walls to come down. And so we realize something. I love this because I tell you something, if the word worked then, yes. the word will work now. Yes. If the word had enough power to knock down a wall, the word can change any situation in your life. Like, I love that, you know, what you just said about Christmas. I can go out of Christmas with more money than I went into it. Yeah. I tell you something, that like hit me, yeah. right? Because I, I'm, you know, you ever heard that old teaching like, who told you? You know, I think my dad taught that actually. You know, who told you, right? Who told you this? Who told you that you had to be less? Who told you you had to have less? If the word would work to knock down a wall, I promise you, it'll work to fill your bank account. And so let's put this into perspective for a minute. As Joshua is, Joshua is staring at this wall, I tell you something, he must be absolutely terrified. Like, can we be real? Like, imagine how you would feel. Not just that you had to go to war, but you had to lead like three million people, God's chosen promised people. Like, you're feeling the pressure. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, if I was, I was babysitting Olivia the other day and I'm like extra careful with her because I know that she's Mike and Jess's, she's the chosen one, right? <laughs> now, imagine how Joshua would have felt knowing that he's not leading a bunch of people where it's like, you know, he's not playing like, you know, Mario Brothers, where he doesn't really care if he lives or dies. You know, he just starts over again. Joshua was not feeling that. He's feeling the intense pressure of these are God's people. This is God's chosen group, and I'm supposed to lead them into something that really I have no idea. Like, he, this is the extent of what Joshua did. He was like, dick, dick, dick. like he was a stonemason, right? And so like, he's thinking, well, maybe I could like chisel my way through the wall maybe or something. But he's realizing I'm not qualified in order to do this. And so that's why when God shows up the scene, you know, he tells him, be strong and courageous. You know, sometimes I find myself doing that with Joshua. You know, when you read this story, 
you're kind of almost like, come, all right, Joshua, like, get on with it, man. Like, man up, bro. Like, let's do this. And that's why God shows up to him and says to him multiple times throughout this story, be strong and courageous. Because Joshua had to fight the Canaanites. You know, he had to fight the Amalekites. He had to fight the Hittites and the Jebusites, right? He had serious, he had a fight ahead of him. But the beautiful thing is that God tells him what to do, and he also tells him what not to do. I tell you, those things are equally as important. He tells us, yes, meditate on the word day and night. He tells us, you know, you know to, to do these things, keep the book of the law. But he also tells us what not to do. And he says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. You know, at, you know, there's sometimes, you know, as I read these stories, as I like to put myself in there, it's kind of frustrating to me because I like to think to myself, you know, God, how can you say that to him? You know, like God is not here. You know, he's not, you know, he shows up one time. You know, Jesus comes and instructs him and then he's gone, you know? And it's like, I, I feel bad for Joshua in the sense where God is telling him, you know, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. And, you know, I'm feeling that feeling for him because I'm realizing, you know, that, that Joshua feels underqualified. You know, as he looks around at the people, he feels undermanned, right? He feels under resources. Like, you know, he's thinking about these people and they're like going to war, but they don't have very much around them. He, he sees that. And I ask myself in that, I'm, I'm thinking about it as if I'm Joshua, like how in those moments do I feel not afraid? But you know what I love about this is that God doesn't tell him not to feel afraid. God tells him, don't be afraid. I'm going to propose something this evening. You can feel afraid, but you don't have to be afraid. You can feel discouraged, but you don't have to be discouraged. You see, too often, our default is fear and discouragement because I think that we think that when we feel something, it means that we are that thing. And I think that what God was telling Joshua was in the midst of his fear, and he had the ability to speak to Joshua about these things because what he was talking about was beyond a feeling. It was beyond this momentary, temporary emotion that he was experiencing. And God was speaking to Joshua an eternal truth. That if you can just keep yourself from staying in a state of fear, not this emotion of fear that when you look at the wall, you feel like, you know, you're going to poop your pants, okay? We're not talking about that. What we're saying is, do we have the ability and the fortitude to, in the midst of feeling something, have the ability to not be that thing? Because I tell you something, each of us has a destiny. Just like Joshua. I want to tell you the reason why we're preaching courage and the reason why we're talking about courage and we're doing all these things is, is not because it's a good topic. It's because we believe that you have a destiny. I believe that you have a destiny just like I believe I have a destiny. Now, your destiny may not be to lead, you know, four million people into battle and knock down walls, but I tell you something, whatever the destiny is that God has for you to do, it's there. Right. It's possible. It doesn't matter how impossible it seems. God promises to us that if we can just do a few things, that those things are possible. But I must warn you that the bigger the destiny, the bigger the enemy. And the reality is, is that sometimes what can happen to us in the midst of this, and especially as we're in this Christmas season, what can happen to us is that we start to think that the wrong, the, that the wrong enemies are our enemies. What I realized in this story from Joshua is that you notice that God doesn't talk to him about the Canaanites. God doesn't talk to him about the Jebusites. He doesn't talk to him about battle strategies on how to be those things because God realized that those people weren't his enemies. God spoke to him about his enemies and his enemies were, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. You see, sometimes what can happen to us is we can think that our enemy is the situation. Our enemy is the problem. Our enemy is sometimes the person, or maybe sometimes even our enemy is ourself. But I'm here to tell you this evening that from what we read in the book of Joshua, I realize that none of those things are my problem. My enemy is the fear that tries to get me when I step into a situation that I don't quite understand. Because I tell you something, those things are your main enemies in your life. 
I tell you, if you can go without feeling discouraged, you will get to your destiny. If you can live refusing to step into fear, you will absolutely live in the freedom that Jesus promises to you. But I tell you, where, jo- where God saw Joshua, where he saw his vulnerability, where God saw Joshua's potential weakness, the potential pit that he could fall into was this place of fear and discouragement. He didn't have to talk to no battle plans or strategies. Because I tell you something, what the Lord knew was that his word was enough. Sometimes we want to mix his word and our ability, and sometimes we get caught intertwining them in the middle. But I love that God wasn't trying to give him battle strategies. The only strategy God gave him was talk the scripture and don't be afraid. And so as I see this in the book of Joshua, well, I, I realized that, you know, in, in, that this wasn't the first time that Joshua had been in this place. And I think this is another reason why I love the story of Joshua, because it kind of encompasses all the different things that we've talked about. In the sense that Joshua, we all know this, was here standing looking at the walls of Jericho 40 years before this. So it wasn't just that Joshua was here at the first time and he had no idea what he was about to get into. He's had 40 years thinking about, meditating about what the battle that he was eventually going to face looked like. But Joshua understood something. And, and if we, can we read uh, Roman, Numbers chapter 13 really quickly? Numbers chapter 13, and we're going to read verse 31 and 32. It says this, but the men, so we know the story of what's happening. Basically, what, 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 uh, what Moses has done is, you know, they've made their short trek. I think that the reality was it was only like a month journey or something like that, six weeks journey for them to get from where they were to the promised land. It didn't actually take them 40 years. They basically like wandered in circles for 40 years. Like, that's a bummer. So the first time what happens is, is that Moses talks to, you know, he takes 12 spies and he says to the 12 spies, I want you to go into the land and I want you to scope out the land. I want you to go and get a report, see what it's like and, you know, see the good and see the bad and come back and give me a report. And it's a famous scripture and we all know it. And so we pick it up in verse 31, it says this, but the men who had gone up, who had gone up with him, so we're talking about the 12 spies here, said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report about the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. You know, basically I, what I realized from this was is that these men, they came in and they came back and they gave Israel a report that says, we can't do this on our own. Isn't that the truth? They saw the people in there. They saw the giants. They saw what they were about to face. They saw who they, were, who they were in comparison to who the giants were. And they came to the conclusion that says, we can't do this. But then, you know, as you go further on, you realize that Joshua has a totally different report. And Joshua reminds them that, yes, they are bigger. Yes, they are stronger. Yes, they are mightier. Yes, they may devour the inhabitants of the land, but we are not alone. I think that this is one of the most important factors as we get ready to walk into 2018 is to remember the simple fact that says we are not on our own. That as you get ready to go into and do the different things that God is asking you to do, you have to remember the simple fact that when God calls you and asks you to step out into something that maybe you don't think that you can accomplish, he's not asking you to do it on your own. He's not asking if whether in yourself you have the strength or the ability. He's not asking you in yourself if you have the wisdom in order to make the battle, pl- the battle plans in order to get through to win the victory. All God is asking us to do is can you go and believe that you're not alone? Because that was the beauty about what Joshua understood. His perspective was simple, which was we are not alone. That when we go and face these giants, when we go and face these people, we aren't alone. And as I thought about this, what I realized was, was that the spies were trying to talk Moses out of something that God was trying to bring him into. And as I thought about this, and I thought about my own life, and I thought about where we are in this courage teaching, I thought to myself this question, what am I trying to talk myself out of that God is trying to bring me into? 
in my relationships, in business things, church things, anointing things, personal things, whatever it is. I promise you something, each of us in some area of our life are trying to talk ourselves out of something. But you know, I realized something. You know that we can talk ourselves into things just as easily as we could talk ourselves out of them? That we've become really good at talking ourselves out of things, but if we just do it in reverse, we'll actually be really good at talking ourselves into things. You know, and this is something that I'm like especially good at. You know, I like to think that, you know, it's my preaching ability. But as I was younger, I was so good at talking myself out of things. Like, I was pretty well a master at this. And, you know, I really think that, you know, I excelled in school, but I'm talking about everything. I could talk myself out of speeding tickets. <laughs> Hopefully there's no police out there. I think I've literally, I haven't been pulled over in a long time, but there was a period of time, I've probably been pulled over like 15 or 20 times, and I only have one speeding ticket, okay? And it's the grace of God in my life, praise the Lord. But I'm really good at talking myself out of things, like, you know, detentions in school, suspensions in school, talking myself out of homework. But I remember, I remember there was this one teacher, his name was Charles Legg, okay? And Charles Legg was, he was a different kind of guy, and I had heard about him. I think he was my grade 10 geography teacher. And I had heard about him that he was a no-nonsense kind of guy. Um, but for me, you know, I had always kind of had the same approach to high school, which was, you know, start doing your homework assignment two days after it's due, okay? And so I had gotten really used to the fact that, you know, I could kind of show up on the day and I could come up with my thing and I could talk myself out of it and I could always get an extension. But I remember this day, you know, uh, you know I, everybody's handing in their homework assignments and things are happening. And, you know, Mr. Legg is there and he notices that I didn't hand in my assignment. And so he calls me up to his desk, right? Now I'm prepared for this because I'm trained in the art of manipulation, okay? <laughs> I know, I, I've already got the lines, I got it down, I know what to do, you know, so I walk up and I'm smiling and I got the thing, I'm kind of playing the victim card, you know, I'm scattering through like my top 10 excuses that I'm gonna use that I know have worked in the past and I'm trying to come up with like my best shtick of what I'm gonna do and so I walk up fairly confident even though what I actually did was wrong and as I go and as I open my mouth and I'm like, you know, Mr. Leg, I, and he immediately stops me. He's like, yep. And I'm like, well, you know, my, his, uh. and he said this to me. He said, Alex, I think he called me Alex McDonald. I was kind of notorious at this point in high school. He said to me, you have met your match. <laughs> was a bad day for me, to say the least. <laughs> but I remember, and so, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm kind of like at his mercy at this point because what I had, what has carried me through my whole high school career has all of a sudden crashed and burned. And so I asked him, you know, well, what should I do? And he said to me, well, you should do better on your next assignments because you got a zero on this one. <laughs> and so you should do better on the next ones, you know, to bring up your average right? Okay. And I walked away from there and I realized that, you know, as I'm looking back at it, I realized something that Moses tried to do the same thing when God called him to be the deliverer of Israel. Don't we know that? That, I mean, when you read through the account, I mean, how many of you think that, well, if you go up onto a mountain somewhere and there's a burning bush, right? I mean, the last thing that I'm thinking about doing is coming up with excuses as to why I shouldn't do what the burning bush <laughs> is telling me to do. Okay. I would probably be like running down the hill or something else, but Moses came up with excuses, but this is what God, Moses did. You know, he comes to him and says, you know, I can't speak and I can't do it and I can't this and I can't that and I can't, and I imagine myself, you know, Charles Legg is the voice of God saying to Moses, Moses, you have met your match. And I think that for us, what we have to realize is that God was prepared for all the reasons why Moses and Joshua and everybody in the scripture couldn't be who God said that they were. But God was never moved by people's reasons or excuses. And so we see in Numbers chapter 14, this is where Joshua steps up. 
Numbers chapter 14, verse 6, and it says this, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of some other guy, (laughs) poor guy with that kind of name, Who who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and as they spoke out to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. You know, immediately from the scripture, I realized something. You know, Joshua and Caleb, they didn't go and spy out a different land. They didn't go to a different place. They didn't, you know, they weren't sleeping on the job. But our perspective is everything. The way that I perceive the situations that I'm going through, the way that I expect, the way that I see myself, the way that I see what God has asked me to do is everything in my life. They go on to say this. And as they spoke unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, the land, is ex- the land that we pass through and spied out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land that gives us a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Funny how when the other, the ten spies, They were talking about how we are nothing in their sight. And Joshua was looking at them saying, they are nothing in my sight. He had a different perspective about who he was and who he was with. It says this, not only do not rebel against the Lord nor fear the people of the land for they are bread. Their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. You see, God is with me don't be anxious. God is with me. Don't be nervous. God is with me. Don't be afraid. God is with me. Don't be dismayed. And as I look at this, I realize something. That Joshua in this moment, you know, I wish that it would have made the story so much better if at this point when Joshua came up and he came out with all the rest of the 12 spies and he gave this report that, you know, that Moses would have heard from Joshua and Caleb And would have said, you know, yeah, that's it. You guys are right. But I realized something that someone someone else can't ever talk me into my destiny like I can. Moses chose to go with the report of the 10 spies because that was what he believed in his own heart. What we believe is the direction where we go. And in Deuteronomy 31, I'm not going to go there, but you realize something that Moses gives Joshua really the same account. And I'm, I'm done. I'm closing with this. Moses gives Joshua the same account, except for the fact that God, Moses tells Joshua the what and the why. He tells him the what and the why, but he doesn't tell him the how. He tells him, you know, don't be afraid. He tells him, you know, you could do this. He gives him the pep talk, but he never actually comes to the point and tells him how. But in Joshua chapter one, verse eight, we see God gives us the how. He gives us the understanding of what do we do that takes me from fear to faith? What do I do that, what it, that takes me from discouragement to my destiny? And that is that we understand that the word of God should never depart from our lips. And as I'm closing, I'm going to get really practical because David gives us a really amazing example of this. This is the last scripture that I'm going to read. And it's in Psalm chapter 42. If we could, you could flip there or it's going to go up on the screen in two seconds. Yes, it's a faith statement. That's right. I believe. Psalm chapter 42 We read in verse four. I'll just give it to you kind of roughly. Basically in this story, we see Josh, or we see David do this amazing thing. And and this is what I feel like what we have to, where we're going with this. Is that if you read through the first, the verse, the first four verses of Psalms chapter 42, we see basically David is lamenting. Okay, you know, he's saying, you know, my soul thirsts for you, Lord. You know, he makes this statement in verse three, which I think is, it's the most dramatic statement ever. He says this, my tears 
have been my food day and night. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> literally, it's probably someone's favorite verse. No, I'm not laughing. Because maybe, they're, they're, you know, anyways. But, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just think it's funny. But basically, you <laughs> No, it's just like it's just like high school teen girl, you know? <laughs> That's how it feels to me. Like you're just, oh I'm so broken, my tears have been my food, right? <laughs> but we see something in this in this passage of scripture is is that David is doing, I think, what we need to learn to do. Because like, can I be real with you for just a minute? We are all, in our journey to get to our destiny, we're all going to go through challenging times. We're all going to go through times where we don't understand why God would let this thing happen to us. But I think that what we can read in David's little story here, his, his, his moment that he has is, is we can realize that David is going through such a moment like this. I mean, I would tell you, I don't think there are tears of joy that he's talking about at this moment, but we're talking about tears of sadness, tears of hardship. We're talking about tears of pain and anguish that he's going through. And he's living in a place where he would describe how he's feeling is that it's been my food. This is, it's been, it's been my life. It's been all, the only thing that's been happening in me. But, but what I realize in verse five is, is he does something that's amazing. And I think that this is what, what I wanted to say and where we need to get to. And I think that what 2018 is gonna be, is gonna be our launching pad is that David begins to preach to himself. Listen to what he says in verse five. He says this, why are you cast down, O my soul? Now this is a seriously different expression going from my tears are my food and now he's learned how to rebuke himself. I tell you something, this is what Joshua chapter 1, 8 is telling me to do. That as I allow the word of God to be on my lips, what it's doing is, is it's creating an environment where I am, like David said, encouraging myself in the Lord. Because you see, sometimes you can't expect that that text is going to come or that email or that, you know, that thing is gonna happen. Sometimes you can't even rely on friends or family members in those difficult moments. But I tell you something, there is something you can always rely on and it is the word of God that it will always produce the results in our life that we're looking for them to produce. You see, because I, what I've realized is this, that if I ask myself how I feel, I mean, I'm 50-50 at best, right? Like, I mean, it's a flip of a coin. When I get out of bed in the morning, it could really go either way. But I tell you something, I learned something in the process of getting to my destiny. And it's that I, I can't afford to allow myself to ask myself how I'm feeling. Smith Wigglesworth said it like this. There was a story about Smith Wigglesworth, and if you don't know him, you should definitely go research him because he was one of the most amazing men of God. And, you know, he, he was going through a, a challenging time, and he was preaching a ton. And, you know, somebody came into his house and, you know, asked him, you know, thinking that this is the problem with, like, the, the older, the people, the men of old. You know, I feel like they were just harsh, you know. And so this guy came in, he's trying to be, like, loving, you know. Like, it's kind of like a cordial thing to ask somebody, like, how do you feel? You know, it's kind of like a nice thing. But so this person goes into Smith Wigglesworth's house, and he asks him, you know, Smith, how you feeling? And Smith Wigglesworth responded to him and said this, Smith doesn't ask Smith how he feels. He tells him how he feels. You see, in Psalm 42, verse 5, this is what we're experiencing David doing in this moment is, David is through asking himself how he feels and he's begun to preach to himself to remind himself that this is what the Lord says about how he should feel. He's preaching to himself, telling himself, this is how you're supposed to feel. I tell you something, courage, your courage comes from who you're conversating with. Who are you? What are you? talking to on a regular basis. That will determine to us where our confidence comes. And so we see this. We see this moment that God has with Joshua. 
And Joshua says this to him, meditate on the word day and night. I tell you something, if we're gonna experience what God is asking us to do, the further that I go in this journey, the more that I become convinced of this. I tell you, I have searched for 10 years for another way other than this way to get to where I want to get to. But I tell you, if my 10 years of experience has taught me one thing, it's meditate on the word day and night. Then you will observe to do all that is written in it. There is no shortcut to getting to your promise. Your promise comes from the word. And so in my last literally two minutes, I wanna keep it really practical. And I apologize, this is supposed to be early. But I really felt that as we're preparing for 2018 that we need this. Sorry? Take out the shepherd's sack on Sunday. That's right. This is the last moment of grace for 2018, 2017. So this is what I want to say. This is what the Lord said to me. We have to learn how to take control of our conversation. It's so easy for us to get caught in the, the way of thinking, I won't be enough. I won't have enough. I actually think that those are the two main areas of fear that we experience in our life. That I either, I won't be enough or that I won't have enough. I think that if you look at any fear that you can have, you know, I don't want to be single because that's going to tell me that I'm not enough and so I'm afraid of that, right? I might, you know, I'm not going to be able to have a good Christmas, which is going to tell me that I don't have enough, which is I'm afraid of that. Every fear comes from those two things. And that's where it's so important for us to have a phrase. And I learned this about the phrase because I've tried to do the whole confession thing where like you have like a pocket full of confessions. And the problem is, is that it's, it's so long. It's so challenging. It's like, you know, even though it's like three minutes at the, beginning, at the beginning of every hour, it feels like that three minutes is an eternity, right? And so I've learned this, is I have a phrase. <clears throat> three minutes, five minutes. Some of them are 15 minutes, right? Depending on how intensely hardcore you are. But I've learned this, is I have a phrase that I say. And I heard this from a minister and I've adopted it into my own life, is, is it's four counts in and four counts out. Because that's how you breathe. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I've started saying this. Christ is in me. I am enough. So as I'm walking on the street, you know, I was walking my dog. <laughs> I was walking my dog today just down the street. And I catch myself under my breath doing what Joshua chapter 1, 8 says. I'm just talking to myself. Like I'm breathing. You know, so I'm just walking. And I'm just saying, Christ is in me. I am enough. Christ is in me. I am enough. You know, as I look at the fear in my life and I look at the things because we all face fears. I'm looking at them and I'm saying to myself, Christ is in me, I am enough. Looking at that thing that kept me awake last night that I was so nervous about and as I lay in bed, I say to myself, Christ is in me, I am enough. You know, I've discovered something that the more time that we can spend focused on the word, rather than our situations, the faster we get out of those things. I tell you something, like we read about in basically every scripture of the Bible, you know, all the way from Adam, right on, you know, to read it in the book of Revelations, is our perspective is everything. So can we just do that? Just in your seat where you are, where this is playing, I just want you to say that to yourself. Christ is in me, I am enough. Just say it a couple times, just like breathing. Think about that impossible situation. Think about all the times they said you can't, you won't.
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for this moment of what you're doing in us. Lord, that you are setting us up to succeed. Lord, like we've read about in the book of Joshua, like we see in the life of David and Daniel, we see in the life of Jesus, that you are setting us up to be victorious. So Heavenly Father, in this moment we do that. We breathe in. Christ is in me. And we breathe out. I am enough. Christ is in me. I am enough.